You met Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak when they were still working out of the Jobs family garage. You were already a successful advertising and PR agency owner. What made you decide to get behind Apple's founders? You know, it, it wasn't a quick decision. Um, we had we, we had a lot of business. Uh, we were very successful in the early days, and we were sort of unique in our ability to sort of go beyond the, the advertising of the PR to help people uh, strategize and help them even set up distributors, set up training programs, you know, do in-depth technical articles, those kinds of things. So the Valley was a rather small community, mostly you know solid state types of devices, semiconductors, and so forth. So the the news spread, and and because I had worked at two of the startups that spun out of Fairchild, early startups, everybody knew everybody. So there was a, a reference system that, that worked by word of mouth, and and uh, I think I had nine semiconductor clients in the first two years, and then we got Intel in 1971. And that was sort of the creme de la creme of the semiconductor industry because of the founders were, were such high esteemed people, Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore. So, you know, when Steve came in, uh, I had already been working with Intel on a single board computer that we were, that we were packaging and, and bubble wrapping. And, and I had put together a program for selling them through retail stores. So I was well aware of the fact that the personal computer was, was on its way, and I knew the other companies that were in the business. So when they came in, it wasn't a, you know it wasn't a strange uh, a phenomenon. It was it was simply that these two uh, they, they sort of looked like. Um, well, let me tell you what happened. I, I when I referred them to Don Valentine, who was a venture capitalist a fellow who I worked for, was my boss at National Semiconductor. Don called me back and said, why did you send me these two renegades from the human race? <laughs> and um, so they had, you know, long hair and uh, they looked like hippies. But you know, the engineers that we worked, that I worked with at, at both GME and National Semiconductor before starting my business were all strange people. So that didn't bother me at all. Um, it was simply, could, could we possibly handle, handle any additional work? And it wasn't taking a risk because um, I felt I, had, I thought that we would first raise the money for them or help them raise the money. And certainly that's the way it turned out. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we're joined by Silicon Valley marketing legend Regis McKenna. He started his own advertising and PR firm in Silicon Valley before it was even called Silicon Valley. Along the way, he was one of the people who helped define the region and the technology landscape. His work helped create and shape the brands of Apple, Intel, Genentech, and many others. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about the people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. In this episode, we'll get an insider's view of how Silicon Valley took shape and how it shaped the world. What made you decide to leave the employee of someone else and start your own business? Well, you know, I I will say it was a big risk because I didn't didn't really have much money. Uh, I'm sure I had less than $1,000 in the bank. And um, I read all the books on how to start your own business, and you should have, you know, uh, six months of salary stacked up in the bank and all that sort of thing. I I had uh, had many many offers when I was at National Semiconductor to go to work for other semiconductor companies. One in particular was calling me back and trying to recruit me into their company. And so what I did was I went to them and I, I simply said. Uh, what if I, I don't come to work for you, but I, I do your work on a, on a fee basis? And, and they liked the idea. They didn't have to build an overhead. They didn't have to you know, um, pay for more than just the work that I was doing. And um, and said they would consider it. As that moved on, one of the things that I found that in, in the Seneca Capital business is pretty boring. I mean, they, they introduce a lot of products, but it's sort of doing the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. In the same processes, and once you sort of got that process down, it, it, you know it becomes sort of rote. I, w- I really wanted to expand into other areas, so this company did indeed accept my offer. They said yes, they would do it, and so I went over there, over to their 
shop after work one night and I sat in the office of the, the marketing manager and in the next office we're having a meeting and I heard all kinds of yelling and screaming and shouting and what they were arguing over was they didn't tell the COO of the company that they were going to do this. Hmm. It was the founder in VP of marketing and he was upset and he didn't want to do it. And I, I left the company and I went back home. The, my friend over there called me that night and said, where did you go? And I said, well, hey, I'm not going to get in the middle of that. I'd be crazy. But I had already resigned from National. And um, wow. so I, I was basically without a job. And so I just hustled out and went and called on a bunch of friends of mine and, and convinced them to... I got one company that, that said, yes, they would consider it. And I, when they, not, they agreed to do it, I said, no, I can't do it. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I need, I need another account. And so they convinced another company to do it. And so I, I started with two clients. Would you say you were in the right place oh, at absolutely. the right time, too? Because at that time, uh, they didn't call it Silicon Valley just no, yet, did it they? Was not. Um, it, it was not. Uh, it was primarily, uh, you know, the, the new companies were semiconductor companies. You know, I because I had worked for two semiconductor companies, you know, I spoke their language. And and, it's, and I'm sure it's the reason that the, the company, first company I worked for was a company called General Microelectronics. And they were working on a particular kind of technology, chip technology called MOS. It, it really was the technology that built Fairchild or uh, Intel as well and the microprocessor and so forth. All future technologies really relied on that technology that was later improved and refined. But I think that's why Intel actually, um, aside from the fact that they knew the people that I worked for, that's come two companies before, you know, was really inclined to get somebody who, who knew the business because he knew that the micro, I and he he sort of foresaw that the microprocessor was going to could could possibly be a, um, a you know a huge impact on the marketplace, and, and certainly it was. You're most known for your work with Apple, but one of your big clients you just mentioned was Intel. Can you describe your work with Intel and how important that was? Well, in, Intel really sort of rep- and, and Gordon Moore were two of the original eight founders uh, that, uh, that Shockley brought in to develop the transistor. So the transistor was really became successful in, in about 1958, 59. You know, when I was at National, you know, three years later. And so, you know, it was relatively, the, it was a new industry. But they had a reputation, both Moise and Moore, of being sort of more like, you know, um, you know, really outstanding scientists and sort of the reputation of an engineer. They were more than that. They were both physicists. They both had PhDs. They were very articulate and particularly noise. And, and they were really recognized as, as leaders in solid-state uh, technology. That business, I think, was really seminal in that they were, number one, prolific in developing new technologies. I, I think in some years we would have probably launched 100 different program uh, products and technologies across the spectrum as the company grew. They really sort of welcomed us as part of the team. If they didn't look at us as an outside vendor or as today where you work up through the ranks and you have to, you know, go through all sorts of uh, you know, sub-levels of approval. We work directly with the founders and with the top people in the company. And you could, you know, could wander around the company and, and um, meet all the, the designers of the new technologies. So, you know, that worked with the founder, the guy who, who invented the, the microprocessor. The microprocessor was seminal in that it was the... It was the integration of all those components onto a single chip of silicon. It essentially was the original computer on a chip. And what it did was, you know, prior to that, um, they did a little take detail here, but engineers would sit down at a workbench and they would pick components to, to build a prototype circuit board. And then they would test that circuit board and then they would try it out and then they'd go back and redesign it and so forth. It was a long, arduous process, and usually it took you know, a, a designer with two or three technicians to do that over a period of months. What the microprocessor did was it was programmable, and it was infinitely programmable. And so you could uh, essentially, uh, it, was, it was the introduction of software 
into the solid state physics area where you, you program the processor to do what you wanted it to do, just like a computer. And that doesn't sound revolutionary today, but it was revolutionary then because there was nothing like it on the marketplace. Well, that enabled everything to go faster, didn't it? And not just uh, the, the equipment that you used, but the development the process. The development process. You know, it was, uh, and that was key to it because people could develop products faster. They could prototype faster. They could change them in the field. And so, but it, no one out there knew how to program these. Microprogramming was not, a, not something we learned in school when they went to school. And so design engineers were coming out and, and dealing with sort of the, solid-state physics and, and the nature of circuitry, but they, they weren't necessarily dealing with how to program uh, these products through a, a, a computer. And so that really changed and revolutionized things so that the people, the engineers were reluctant to start new kinds of products that hadn't been tested or hadn't been thoroughly uh, vetted by the marketplace. Whereas management began, what we did was we began really campaign of marketing to the managements of top companies and talking to them about faster to market, development cycles faster, new products faster, adaptable, cheaper, all of the kinds of things that management felt they wanted to get into their cycles so they could beat their competition. That took a, that was part of a tensor program at Intel in, in the late 70s called, the, we called it the crush program. And um, it was where Andy Grove had it was then, um, selected uh, nine people to develop a strategy for the company, and I was the only outside member on that team. That program really set the microprocessor as becoming a standardized product in the, in the marketplace. And, you know, it was used in cars, it was used in computers, it was used in white goods, uh, it was used in machine tools, it, you know, almost everywhere you go. One of the examples that Noyce used to give was that the average home at the time had about, you know, 50 um, miniature motors in it. Very, very small motors were in hair dryers. They were in air conditioning. They were in various types of fans, and, you know, and that sort of thing. And house, household appliances. Well, you know, the average home today probably has, um, I don't know, well over 100 microprocessors in it. You don't see them. You don't know they're there, but they're in everything. And, um, you know, the, the hybrid car, the Prius, has 150 microprocessors in it. You know, these are things that are, you know, computers going, you know, working, you know, doing this, doing this sort of task for people that automate things. So that, that really set into it. And it would, if without that, it, Apple would not have been possible. And so it shrunk down the number of components from literally hundreds and thousands down to a few. It, it shrunk the, the design package down. The end product is faster to market and programmable. So that was a revolution, and that changed everything. It certainly brought in the era of the personal computer, and you, of course, were there uh, from the very beginning. From what I understand, you wrote their business plan and created their first logo. Can you describe that process, just getting in on the ground floor with them and, and the process for making them a company? You know, what, we had some other experiences and, and things that were first-time products. So, the, 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 first of all, I have always felt from the beginning that technology products were different than consumer products because most of the promotional, you know, um, agencies work, whether it was New York or Chicago or even some on the West Coast, basically, you know, saw things and, and, and hired people out of the consumer industry to promote their work. One of the things that, that I did was I hired a lot of uh, technical people, uh, a, a lot of uh, journalists who were uh, engineers and then were what they're writing, and then mixed those with more of the creative people. So I built teams out of both creative and technical people who could talk with one another and, and educate one another. When the when the, the you know the first um, personal computer came along. You know, certainly we knew what it was, but I knew that it was going to require an education because it was, it was how I saw technology products in its first phases. It's, it's, it has to, you have to educate the marketplace as to what is this and how does it work and and why why would you want to buy one? In fact, that was sort of sort of the early questions: is what do I do with it? And most people didn't know. You know, you could buy it, but it, it really didn't have many programs on it. So there was, and you had a Pretty much do 
you had to have a, a real knack or a hobby for doing things. And so many of the early users were hobbyists, you know, former engineers or, or people who were willing to spend the time to teach themselves, you know, uh, literally basic programming. The idea that was from Steve Jobs was that you wanted to take these technology, this technology, and, and get it into the hands of teachers and students, and particularly that function he was very interested in the education world, and move it upstream. And so sitting down and writing a marketing plan for it, which is, um, I you know, sketched out in my notebook, December 1976. Um, Apple didn't go, didn't actually become a corporation until you know, January of the next year. So this was, the, I worked with Steve for six months prior to that, starting in about June of 76. And you know, we had a lot of just conversations and talks. So by the time we got down to actually forming and starting a company, you know, I had a pretty good handle on, on how, what we had to do take this product into markets that would well be the hobbyists. And so that required, you know, uh, a lot of our early ads were education ads. And that's how Apple went to these workshops and you know, how these big launches that, that were, came about. That was done as an, as an education opening so that people could learn what is this about, how do you use it, and let's see it demonstrated because products that complex need demonstrated to sell. And, and of course, Steve was really outstanding because he knew the product, knew the technology, and he was, he, was, he was a pretty good showman. And so for him to stand up on the stage and for us to invite in, let's say, hundreds of uh, technical people or ha- hundreds of uh, journalists and analysts into a room, at one time, that enabled him to educate these on the possible and what this product could do and what, you know, what the potential was for it. Uh, without that, in fact, he even said that to me in uh, went to one of his last you know, introductions of one of his iPhones. And I uh, came down off the stage afterwards in the audience and, you know, we hugged him because we were really, really close, I think, pretty close friends. And he said, uh, you know, we started all this a long time ago. <laughs> Because the room was packed, and um, he was right. That whole process was one of educating the marketplace. So the plan I wrote wasn't the business plan; it was the marketing plan. Actually, in that plan, in December of '76, I wrote uh, uh, possible distribution channels would be uh, Apple stores. You know that that came to be too. I pushed for Apple stores for years at Apple. Um, simply because uh, the PC, the IBM PC and Microsoft and Intel combined, they call it the Wintel technology. You know, they, they were absorbing all the developers. The developers were moving away from the Mac and from Apple to the PC. And so to overcome that, that's, uh, and, to, and to get some exclusivity on our distribution channels, I thought it was necessary to have Apple stores. Why do you think they finally went with Apple stores when they did? Well, they they did actually at one point, and people don't realize they did. They did in the eighties. They before Steve came back the second time, they opened about five or six Apple stores. But the people that did it weren't very knowledgeable. didn't didn't have the imagination that Steve had, and um, they opened them up in industrial parks, and so you know, they got no foot traffic and. It really, they weren't set up as a demonstration medium. And there was a great fear that uh, because the, the dealers had franchise territories that they would step on, on the dealer's toes by, uh, by selling directly themselves. So um, uh, those stores didn't work, and they, had a, you know, they shut them all down. Steve came back in and, and hired uh, Tim Cook. Tim Cook really was an expert in logistics, and he was able to set up the whole logistics of sourcing and distribution using electronics and not Apple's, not Apple's brains, but using the brains of the network to, to build, his, uh, build his inventories across the world. One of the things that comes up today in the marketing of any tech product, either to business to business or to consumers, is this idea that you have to educate the customer before you sell them. And I know that from reading about the early days of your firm, your even your earlier books, that you've always been a person who's preached education first. Can you describe that philosophy, why education is so important to the marketing process? 
I think that, that when, you, when you look at the, let's say, consumer products, the, the, you know, the, you don't have to worry when, when you go in to buy it, grow your groceries. Let's say you go into shopping, you, you, uh, you want to buy, I don't know, cereal, packaged cereal. You don't have to worry about the compatibility of the milk and the sugar with it, you know. But when you buy technical products, you always have to worry about, you know, the stability of the company, um, the fact that the company can provide service and long-term support, the fact that when they put a product into the marketplace, particularly today, that it has the ability to develop the software and can sustain the development of the software as, as the marketplace changes and keep upgrading and changing it. So that there's so much more that goes into a technical product in terms of the, the getting it off the ground, you know, creating the assurance and the trust and the belief that this product, this company will uh, will sustain that technology in the marketplace so that you're not left in the cold by buying, you know, committing your money and your funds to a product that will only last a, a year or two until the company goes bankrupt. And also the compatibility, you know, at that time, you know, the, the most hardware companies weren't developing their own software. So you had to get third party software people to buy into it. And so a key part of it was to educate the software people early on before even the product was introduced and get those product, those people to commit resources to applications on that, pro, on that product. So there's a whole, you know, it's like a Rubik's cube. And it's, and it's, the Ruby Cube has just gotten more and more complex, but the little pieces all have to fit into place. And those pieces you define early on, what are they? How do we have to get them to work together? And you start working on that sometimes a year or more in advance of the actual product introduction. So it's much more than just sitting there with an engineer, you know, interviewing them and then going away and, and writing a press release or writing a, uh, you know, an ad. You, you really have to get things into place because the, the market infrastructure is what becomes very important in sustaining the, 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 the availability of that marketplace. So when you read the Wall Street Journal or you read uh, an article on it, what generally they do is it's he said, you said journalism. They generally start quoting people within the marketplace who have tried the product or they ask for opinions of people in the marketplace and so you have to have all those people in the marketplace educated before you go out and talk. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people do is they, they sort of just put it out there and, then, and, and let the marketplace you know, run freely with it. But they don't really set up the, the, and, and educate the infrastructure before they do that. And, and I, that becomes essential in technology products. It is, it is, I always felt, really, really different, particularly in early phases. I think when it, when it becomes well-known, then, then you can go into a you know, broader kind of commercial activity. But in the early days of a microprocessor, and for years, and you may recall this, the first question that anybody would ask about a personal computer, you, they would always ask somebody, what personal computer should I buy? When I used to give talks back in, 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 the, in the 80s, I would ask, you know, I would talk to you know, hundreds of people around the world and audiences. I would say, how many people in this room have asked the question of someone, what personal computer should I buy? And almost the entire audience would raise their hand. I mean, people wanted assurances. So, so you bought it because it was recommended by a friend. And that happened for the first five or six years within the personal computer until it, until it became so prolific that you know it, it, it became um, a, uh, you know basically a commodity, but that wasn't true in the early days. It was it was still a very scary device to people. In fact, you know it's it's still scary to people because when something goes wrong, people say, "Well, what did I do wrong?" And it may not be anything you did wrong. It may be something in the computer or something in the system that that, that shuts it off or shuts it down or or, or does something. But people generally blame themselves. I did something wrong. So the computer product is still a mysterious uh, animal to people. That's true. When you buy something like a personal computer, even today, it's not an inexpensive purchase. So people want to make sure they do their exactly. homework before they do it. So, so I developed a curve, and the curve uh, has on the one hand, uh, you know, sort of the, the price, and on the other hand, the, the risk. So the, the left side is the, the risk, the, the bottom is the, the price. And you know, if you put down in the apex of the two lines, Pepsi and Coke, 
they're interchangeable. I mean, if you're on an airplane and somebody says, well, we don't have Pepsi, but we have Coke, I say, okay. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's secure, it's packaged securely, you, you trust it. Doesn't if you, if you don't if you leave half of it empty it's not a, you, no one thinks of it as wasting a lot of money at the other end of the spectrum at the top curve where high risk and high price you put heart surgery and when you do heart surgery you don't look for a surgeon in the phone book you, you go to someone who has done it before who has the experience so you try to minimize the risk by finding the best possible people and location and so forth to have it done and you can put all products on that curve. And, and they can move up the curve. So computers, particularly large, expensive computers, have, are maybe halfway up or even three quarters of the way up because when you buy it, let's say you buy a supercomputer, you're just going to buy it. You're going to spend millions of dollars for that. And you want to make sure that the company has had experience, that the company is going to be in business for long term, that the company is going to sustain the growth of the, the software support for it and the service for it. And so as you move up that spectrum, it requires much, much more than simply you know, promoting and selling and distri- distributing the product. That's how I would look at, at early technology products as being somewhat you know, up that curve and then moving down the curve. And so today, you know, a personal computer is certainly not where Pepsi and Coke is, but it's, you know, it's, it's up that curve a, a bit. And so it requires a lot more initial activity and support and so forth. If you would like to receive a transcript of today's episode with Regis McKenna, make sure to send an email to me, tim at shapingopinion.com, or you can fill out our contact form at our website at shapingopinion.com. Now let's get back to our episode. When we talked before, you mentioned that innovation is the lifeblood of Silicon Valley and tech. If, if, if you're not talking about something new, you're in trouble. You, you said, and I know your firm created buzz around a lot of firsts. Uh, What were some of the firsts that your client launched? Back in the seventies, even, you know, before Intel uh, or about the same time, maybe there was a company called Spectrophysics that was a laser company. They developed lasers for um, commercial use. And they got the first laser, you know, the low-level light laser that went into um, supermarket checkout counters, you know, scanning. That really revolutionized the ability to scan products and have labels read out from them. That really revolutionized the uh, the retail business. Again, I'm. You know, old enough to remember that people were frightened of that. They they would not go. There was boycotts. There was people would not go through the checkout counter if there was a laser there because they thought you know it would make you know men sterile and it would cause problems, health problems, mm-hmm. and all sorts of things. That that was an education process. And so again, um, you know, it's it's complex first time technologies. Another one, aside from the first microprocessor and the first solid-state semiconductor memory, the first EEPROMs, you know, the little devices you use today, you can plug in the thumb, thumb drives. That original technology was called EEPROMs, and that was, you know, you could erase it, program it. It was a programming chip, and then you could pro- put the program in, and you could erase it and do it again, so it became infinitely adaptable. That was Intel. Um, I would say a lot of products came out of Intel were really first time products that had not been uh, designed or invented before. There was recombinant DNA. Little story there. This is uh, this is a basically today it's production technology used for developing things like insulin. And um, there was a fellow named Bob Swanson who was the founder. He he worked at Kleiner Perkins, uh, a venture capital firm, and. Uh, and when Bob left Kleiner to, to you know, find his, look for something to do, he, he identified a, a fellow at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, outstanding you know, medical research co- uh, hospital up there, uh, a fellow by the name of Herb Boyer. And Herb was working with a fellow at Stanford to develop this recombinant DNA that enabled you to essentially take 
to alter DNA to put it into a process where you put it in something like an E. coli, and E. coli would would be like a manufacturing process. And in fact, it was very similar to kind of like making beer with yeast. And so you could mass produce this, um, the result of it, which was um, a, a recombining of the DNA to create a protein. The first one that they were going to work on was uh, what was called somatostatin, but it was the first step before um, creating insulin. Inc- incidentally, the one of the things that was kind of interesting for me at that time was that Herb Boyer went to St. Vincent's College, hmm. and and he uh, and and I went to St. Vincent's College, and so uh, when I um, when I read first met him when it was just two of them in the company again. I happened to get his resume, and I saw that. And so, uh, you know, we had something in the first meeting. We had something in common. I think he's he, he may be on the board of St. Vincent's right now too. So he's been he he lives from Western Pennsylvania. He was born and raised in Dairy, PA. So there was an identification between us, and so we got along really really well. That technology again was um, the public really got up in arms about you know. Uh, recombining DNA and, you know, being God, you know, and there were people who fought it saying, you know, we're going to create two headed giraffes and, you know, three headed monkeys and we're going to re, re, you know, design human beings and all of that sort of thing. So there was this, you know, sort of public outcry against this technology when in effect it was out to create new kinds of pharmaceuticals or new kinds of proteins that could be used to cure diseases. So that took that took a fair amount of work to to educate the marketplace that that's not what this is about, and that had to be done on a personal basis, and it had to be done by essentially bringing analysts and journalists into into Genentech and and working with them and demonstrating and showing them and having you know the key people talk to them. And in fact, one of the things that I began very early was that there was a a, a marked contrast between East Coast and West Coast in terms of, of technologies and companies. The the companies on the East Coast were well established, you know, IBM, Digital Equipment, Honeywell, you know, and so forth. I mean, these were large companies. They built around, you know, large mainframe computers and centralized computing. The West Coast was much more distributed. The microprocessor distributed computing into many, many areas. And so instead of building a large mainframe, you distributed the work across many, many different platforms. And the same with recombinant DNA, the early work on that was to essentially not just go along with mixing compounds to create a new drug, but to recombining, essentially um, creating human-like um, processes uh, out, of, out of proteins and so forth that could, that could um, go in and solve problems that were not easily done by just building compounds in a, in a jar or in a lab. So that took a, a significant amount of, of work of engaging the people on a personal basis with the people that did the work. So early on, I would take the, the companies that were both my clients or even before that, National and g and and I would take them to New York because the, and, and meet with the journalists and, and sit down across the table with analysts. And they now began to see that these people were not only much more intelligent than they assumed, but they were, you know, they, they had a broad spectrum of knowledge about the impact of their technology on society. I, there was there was an article that, uh, I mean, I have a lot of these articles that I saved back in those days, and, and Morgan Stanley published a, uh, a report that said that it's unlikely that any of these small startups, particularly those on the West Coast, are going to make any impact on the world. If there's any new technologies that come out, they're probably going to be developed by divisions of very large companies because the small companies cannot afford to build the infrastructures necessary to sustain them. Mm -hmm. And so that was the attitude. Mm -hmm. And so there was a sort of, yeah, there's a lot of guys, crazy guys out. In In fact, when I wrote my first book, it was reviewed by some people at Harvard and one of the Harvard professors came back and said, you know, he drinks too much of that West coast (laughs) Kool-Aid. And so, you know, there, there, there was this idea that, you know, you, you had to do this in a really established fashion, whereas the people on the West Coast, I mean, again, you didn't, get a, you didn't become a president of a company or a vice president or move up the ladder 
unless you were at the company, you know, 40, 50 years. But on the West Coast, these, you know, the, the original founders of, of Intel and Fairchild, you know, they were all, um, uh, there was only one over 30 years of age. You know, these were young people with young ideas, and, and they teamed out of step with the traditions of American uh, industry and manufacturing, and they were. But they also had to, had, you had to get, the, the, if you will, the media in front of them and, and to engage with them. That is what really, you know, started popularizing um, the idea that these new technology companies are something more than than simply, um, uh, you know, another company. I've seen this myself. One thing that gets their attention in New York, in places like New York and on Wall Street, is when they start to see those sales numbers go up. Yeah, uh, the, the, the significant change, by the way, I mean, I, I pondered the streets of New York on my own. I didn't, I didn't go with, for clients. I went on my own, and I just went back there, and I would call on everybody. I would call on the television stations and the radio, and, you know, and I would meet analysts and so forth, and, and I, would, I would pitch these companies. I mean, I would basically tell them what they're doing. And, they, and when I could, I would bring along, you know, people from the company themselves. But it wasn't simply that. What changed the media really was the personal computer. That was a significant change because it was the first product that journalists used. They actually were using them, typing on them, and it was something in their hands. So the microcomputer became part of the journalist's life in the, in the mid-'80s, and the analysts were using them. Particularly, it was a fellow named Ben Rosen, who was uh, an electronic analyst at, um, at Morgan Stanley. He really probably, you know, popularized the, the idea of the personal computer in, in the whole world of finance. He went on later on and on to found a very successful venture capital firm that founded Compact and Lotus and other companies. But, you know, it, it did revolutionize and suddenly they wanted to know everything about the companies that were building these things. Well, their tools are the extensions of themselves and nothing's more important to a journalist than the tool they use to write. It's an emotional issue for them. Yeah, I mean, you know, it becomes the, uh, <laughs> Marshall McLuhan said, uh, we, we make our tools and then our tools make us. <laughs> One thing that you've talked about that I found very interesting in a communication sense is this issue of branding, because it's been many years since people use the term branding in different contexts, but you have some opinions on how and when to start describing your product as a brand and that a brand isn't something you just create yourself, that a brand is not created in a vacuum. How can you explain your philosophy on branding? Well, first of all, I, uh, I've been sort of anti-brand. Uh, <laughs> and, and the reason it's sort of a, a red herring, I've, I've talked against brand for a long time about, you know, focusing on brand. And the reason is, is it's become, it's just become a cliche. It has no meaning. You know, if people hire an ad agency and say, we want, we need a new brand, what they do is they create a new, you know, logo, new letterhead, new ads, you know, those kinds of things. And that's not brand. Brand is the culture of your company, and it is a reflection of that culture in the marketplace. And so it, it really requires a much deeper understanding of, of what brand is. And so to build a brand requires, you know, education within your company. And as I, as I said, you know, marketing, I wrote an article in Harvard Business Review, uh, it's a very popular article, was marketing is everything. They, the, the, the basis behind that is that it isn't a function within a company, it's the culture of the company. How customer oriented is everybody in your company and how as focused are they are in reflecting that in everything that they do. And I think the one, the only, the really one company that has done that, well, seriously, I think two, I think Intel does it because they, they build really fine products and they have a real fine education process and application engineering field work that they do that people don't really see. But Apple does it because everybody in that company really exudes the brand from the standpoint of how they serve people. They, you know, they have, they have extensive education programs throughout the company. They really don't tolerate anybody who doesn't do things, you know, in a, in a quality way. You know, just an example of that was, uh, you know, Steve's sense of design. When we first did that multicolor logo, I didn't, I didn't give you the background of that, but when we first did that multicolor logo, 
they printed it on cardboard boxes that were going to ship the computers. And the the color faded on the you know the, the brown cardboard it was, it was sort of absorbed. And what Steve said is, how can we change that? And we changed it to coated stock. So all of the Apple products were being shipped in these nice white coated stock, which was much more expensive. And Steve said, I'd rather pay for the expense because we'll get that back by, you know, the customer feeling that they're getting a quality product. So eat the, you know, the packaging, the shipping, the service, the follow-up, all of that kind of stuff becomes part of the brand. It's, it, you know, I equate it to quality. Quality is, is um, the manufacturing process, the quality of your product, the care that you put into making sure that you have you know, low failure rates. That's, that's marketing. And, and people don't call all those things marketing, but they are. You know, without them, then you don't have a, a, a product that people can, you know, uh, be proud to have and that they can feel that they're not getting a product that's, uh, that's junk. So, you know, you, you constantly work at everything in the company to refine it, to improve it, to make it better. It's because it will be a reflection of, of you once it's out there. It, it is your sales part, sales activity, you know, on the customer's desk or in, in the car or wherever they use it. So it has to... It has to. It requires this total commitment to superiority in the things that you do in, in every step of the of the business. Every company has a un, unique personality. I, our job, as you kind of illustrated, is to communicate the unique experience that the customer has. But one thing you've also talked about is the perceived benefit a customer has of being associated with a strong product or a strong service that they buy, in other words, a brand. This is true of consumers, employees, and everyone. Why do you think that is, that people, when they make a purchase or when even when they join a company or make an investment in a company, why do they want to associate themselves with winners? Well, you know, you're, uh, <laughs> we learned this from our mothers. You know, your mother always said you're judged by the company you keep. You know, I think uh, th- this goes true in, in fashions. Uh, why do people buy, you know, nice new suits with a, you know, with a well-known brand? Uh, all of those kinds of things are that, uh, and I think I, again, use Marshall McClellan, you know, the Canadian guru on communications and the books that he wrote in the 70s and 80s. You know, all of these things are extensions of ourselves. We look at them at all the media was really an extension of hum, of our human uh, selves into the world. And, and so when you look at something, uh, I mean, look at an iPhone today. I mean, it has become, a, you know, uh, an integral part. I mean, it, it's like you've had an operation and these things have been attached to you. When you, when you buy a car, even if it's, uh, you know, you, you can't afford it, or, 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 or a smaller car that's more inexpensive and so forth, people, people look. Uh, because they know this somehow that it reflects the person who, who's buying it and driving it. And it's because it's an extension of ourselves. It's, it's, our, it's our mode of transportation. It's like walking down the street. You're driving down the street, though. And so it's, it's what McLuhan saw as sort of basic human extension into the world. And when we fuck ourselves out into the world, you, know, you, you want to show that we are... You know, uh, we have dignity, but we are, um, we associate ourselves with fine things uh, or reliable things or, you know, high performance things and choose different ways you want. It's all a reflection of the human uh, being in the marketplace. Those are the expectations people have. There, there's another issue along the lines of expectations that I thought was very interesting. It was a comment you made about the 1984 ad for Apple Computer. And it centers on managing expectations. It's interesting because everyone, when they think of Apple Computer's advertising, they go back to that 1984 ad. But one thing that I read that you said, that it's very important to manage expectations, that that marketing success doesn't create the wrong expectations and lead to failure. Could you explain your thinking on the 1984 ad and, and how that may or may not have went in line with the company's operation or performance? Yeah, there's, a, there's another line that I often use with clients, and that is the ad won all the awards, but the company went bankrupt. <laughs> and so the people who promote that were largely the advertising industry, um, you know, about it being, you know, with the ad. But the ad, if you look at it, was really basically showed a lot of people following uh, one another 
you know, into um, a, um, what do I say, sort of like the, the sheep going over the cliff, you know, following one another and blindly make that move. And the ad was aimed at uh, basically the, the CIOs and corporations. Apple was trying to get their product into, into corporations at the time. You know, the CIO and the people who were responsible for the internal uh, buying of computers, um, you know, again, this was a, this was a startup. This was a, a small company that was, um, its products were not that in, industrial strength products. They, they needed a lot, of, particularly the Mac. You know, it, it, it revolutionized a few things in its examples. But it also was not an easy product to upgrade because it was encased. You know, you weren't easily able to put in a new generation, a new generation of processor, a new generation of software, a new generation of, um, of memory in it. So it required, it really required work to use that product and a lot of patience. Even though, you know, it brought in graphics, it brought in a lot of other kinds of things that were unique. And the pull down menu, all of them, the mouse, all of that was unique. But it, it also, was not a product that was could be bought by the hundreds of the thousands into corporations. And so, you know, a company like IBM could do that with a PC because they had this network of sales and support. So the, the, the Mac, when they went out to advertise it, if you look at it, it's basically saying that people are, are sort of blindly uh, following others off a cliff to... Um, Certainly, everybody in the industry recognized that the people that were, the, you know, the, uh, the sort of 1984 character that was going to rule the world was IBM. That was who they were talking to. And so it basically said all of you IBM customers are just following blindly off a marketplace. And that's not really the good way to talk to your customer, not particularly people you want to talk to your customer. And so, and, you know, the ad did have very little effect on actually moving Apple. If you recall, that's, that was a rant, ad ran. And after that, Apple went into about a 10 year decline. Um, you know, Steve left the company, the, the, the people that came in, there was a short burst and, and gradual comeback, but then Apple went into a, essentially a steep decline after that. So it wasn't proven out in the marketplace that that ad had long lasting effect. The ad was more successful than the company. So, I, you know, I, I think it was a great creative piece. I mean, it really was. Uh, I think that was Jay Shiat's company, and, and I, I, I owe a lot to them. They, they, were, they were my model. They were a wonderful company, and, uh, and, and that's the kind of work they would do, something that was, you know, a masterpiece. But it was a masterpiece at a time that I think – didn't really have much lasting effect on the company or its position in the world of corporate computing. And, and you know, later, and they just didn't have the product for it. To, to go into an enterprise computing, I mean, requires a lot more. And, and I spent a lot of, I did a lot of work on that at, at Apple, you know, presenting what is, a, what, what does it take to get into the enterprise? And, you know, I would go and study, the, you know, the, what IBM did. And I used to make diagrams of all the, you know, they, it required much faster networking. It required, you know, um, uh, off computing memory. It required a lot of systems knowledge and support. And, and they didn't have that at Apple. Um, it wasn't really until the Internet came in that they were really able to connect things in a seamless fashion and high speed across a network. So, you know, the, the, the time really helped create Apple because by the time, uh, you know, the, the 90s, late 90s came in and Steve had come back to Apple, the, the state of technology had moved so far forward that the, the, the speed of processors, the, the cost of memory, the, the, the ability to move things faster across networks, um, the Internet, all of these kinds of technologies weren't there uh, in 1985 and 1986 when the Mac came out and when they were running those ads. That ad would have been one, you know, that kind of ad, Steve came out several times with ads, I think, when he came back, that were much more, um, this is us. This is, uh, and, and those ads, Steve admitted, it was really to put pride back into the employees. They weren't necessarily there to sell product. So I didn't, I saw that, you know, again, the ad agency, the ad agencies often, you know, get enamored with themselves. And it's this whole notion that you know, what is important is, is you know, getting the company 
successful and solid off the ground and backing up into the company and saying, I mean, I, I can tell you that Apple ran an ad. This was not under Steve. This was at later. They ran an ad about the ability to interchange um, software with both the Mac and the PC. And the ad said, you can just pull your disk out of, out of the PC and you put it in the Mac and it works. And so, um, and I knew that was nonsense. So I picked up, I put both computers on my desk. I picked up the phone and called the president. I won't say which one it was, but it wasn't Steve. And I, and I said, uh, I want to tell you what I'm doing right now. I'm looking at a program on the Mac. I'm taking the disc out. I'm putting it in the PC. It doesn't work. I took it out, up that one out of the PC and I put it in the Mac and put it in. I said, it doesn't work. And he uh, said, yeah, if I read your ad, I should, I should be able to do that. Right. So, you know, pull the ad. But we didn't do it. We didn't do the ad. But, you know, you, 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 have, to, you have to be real. And you have to be, you know, honest with your audience. And um, I think, you know, um, just promoting something in order to get an introduction into an industry doesn't help. You know, there's a term in the PR business, perception is reality. And, uh, and I've seen where you've said that sometimes people hire PR firms to change the reality. How do you, how would you describe that whole idea of perception and versus reality? Yeah, and I've always said that but reality also catches up with perception, particularly in a real-time world. And so while you can think about that and creating a perception, in today's world, particularly with the speeds of technology and the speed of knowledge, um, you, you know, the reality catches up very fast. And you can't count on that. It is, it is reality that creates the perception, not vice versa. So, you know, I can go back and probably reconstruct the bones of many companies that thought that. In fact, a lot of the dot-coms basically went out there with exactly that idea, that they would create perception and then raise a lot of money, get a lot of uh, hits on their site, and then turn it into money and, uh, and a product. And I think we saw literally hundreds of those companies go out of business because they all built their, tried to build their business on that idea, and it didn't work. You know. Uh, I guess you, what is it, you can fool some of the people some of the times, <laughs> but uh, not all of the people all of the times. Well, there's one final question I have for you, and it, it's a big one because it's, I, I think it's another one of those points that you've made time and again. You've said there is a difference between communication and information. You've cited that. How would you describe that difference? Well, you know, today we're getting, you can see this, in our world today. I mean, we get tons and tons of information, so much so that, um, you know, it's overwhelming. You know, the numbers of emails now per day are in the billions going across the world. Um, we get a lot of um, junk email. We get, a, a, you know, a lot of you know, fake uh, messages, fake ads, and so forth. That's all information. But it's not communicating anything. And so communication requires, uh, I mean, you know, communication is more than just words on a page. You know, a smile is communication. A laugh is communication. A nod of the head is communication. Uh, uh, you know, any type of expression. There's a lot of things that, that you can put into the realm of communication. But human communication is a, is a complex thing. And it does require, you know, an exchange over time between people and, and it requires you know, a trust in each other that has to be developed. It can't, it just doesn't happen because someone puts a billboard up. And so, you know, that doesn't tell us anything in terms of the person behind that. And so it, it really does require time and engagement and engagement over time in order to develop the, 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 the truly communication environment. That again is how you build a culture, right? I mean, it's, in a, in a company, you, you have a lot of programs in which the company engages in teamwork so that they can communicate across international boundaries of the world, but they work together over periods of time, and, and, and eventually you begin to see what the rest of the people are offering, and you can communicate what you're offering, and as you work together, people start judging based upon your contribution to the whole and, and, and that's human engagement, and that's something we're missing today. You know, it's it's something that, quite frankly, I've been just um, 
speaking with the director of the Mr. Rogers um, Center up at St. Vincent's College. I don't know if you know this, but Mr. Ro- Mr. Rogers puts it, gave all his archives to St. Vincent's College in Latrobe. And I was just uh, just speaking with the director there, and they're trying to foster this whole idea that just putting computers in the classroom is really not a way to educate students. That the students still require that teachers, you know, sort of mentoring and, and monitoring and exemplifying, you know, what it means to communicate using tools rather than having the tools use us. I, I think, I, you know, I think it's it's it's, it's going to be a, you know, a a hard push now because the people have lost patience and people don't seem to have the time anymore. Our lives are filled with so many different distractions that you don't take time to communicate and engage and to understand or to essentially listen. And uh, listening isn't something that it's listening is an activity. It's not a, a passive thing that we do. It's, a, it's, it's an active way of, of hearing other people and hearing what's, you know, what they're really saying and what they mean. And I think that takes time to develop. Regis McKenna, thank you for being with us today. Okay, Tim, it was great talking to you. Make sure to check out our show notes for more information on everything that we talked about today. You'll find more information on Regis McKenna and some of the major stories of Silicon Valley. And don't miss our next episode. Subscribe to the Shaping Opinion podcast in many ways. And they're all free and easy to find at iTunes and at shapingopinion.com. This is where we talk about the people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien.